Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us at Chevaliers from the comfort of your own homes. Uh, we are proud to be the oldest independent bookstore in Los Angeles. And tonight we're thrilled to be hosting an event with two veteran journalists with a lot of wonderful experiences. I've gotten to hear them chatting about what they're doing currently. Uh, but I'm just really excited for everyone to hear what they have to say this evening. Before we get started, I will let you know we record all of our events. That means in addition to being able to view this on our YouTube channel later, uh, it also means you may be recorded if you ask questions, if you have your camera on. Um, so decide whether or not you want that as, as the evening progresses and keep your camera off if you would like to not be pictured. Um, second piece of business, we have books available to ship soon. <laughs> we received signed book plates from Susan. So if you order from us, we will ship those books out as soon as we are able. And I will put a link in here uh, in the chat for you to be able to do that this evening. And then uh, finally, we will have a Q&A portion at the end, and you are welcome to submit questions in the chat throughout the evening or hold them until that time. And Susan has said that she is happy to um, answer specific questions about uh, any college admissions questions you may have for a uh, high school senior or soon to be senior in your life. Uh, so be thinking about things, feel free to pop things into the chat as you hear uh, different parts of Susan's book discussed this evening. I am now excited to introduce one of my bosses. Uh, hold on, here he comes. There we go. Hi, Bert. Uh, Bert Dixler, who is one of the owners of Chevalier's Books, and he will get us started. Thanks, Katie. Um, it's great to know that uh, introducing your boss is exciting. So I hope uh, I, this is probably the time to shut up and, and uh, go away. But uh, I'm excited about the evening. Um, we have two uh, interesting, interesting, smart, fun uh, people to talk about a high anxiety uh, part of life that has been experienced by some of us, will be experienced by um, uh, some of you uh, in the future. Uh, either your kids, yourself, your uh, grandchildren. Um, we're blessed to have uh, John Nielsen with us, whom you will recall as uh, an important voice on national public radio, uh, all things considered. He's uh, spent a professional life as a working journalist and now is a, uh, a professor at Chapman University in the journalism school teaching about podcasting. Um, in a peculiar way, his expertise about uh, examining threatened places and things meshes almost precisely with uh, what Susan Paterno will be speaking about in connection with her interesting, important book, uh, Game On, Why College Admission is Rigged and How to Beat the System. Susan is a longtime, uh, excellent, well-known um, journalist. Um, her book really is in at least three parts, which I thought makes it particularly interesting. First is uh, a tell-all tell of the family experience that she had uh, with four kids going to uh, colleges and applying and going through that craziness. And then the more intimate aspect of figuring out how to pay for this, which is uh, a challenge and I think informs lots of the books uh, uh, storyline. Uh, then it's a pullback about the system more generally with a series of anecdotes about real life uh, people whom you can automatically identify with and experience the uh, thrills and victories uh, and the agonies of, uh, of defeat. And then uh, toward the end, she has uh, prognostications about how the system can will, will evolve and uh, will get um, will get better. But uh, I see uh, our friend Wendy Mogul is uh, on, uh, is listening in. Uh, Wendy, whose book is cited in Susan's book, the, uh, the, the Gift of a Skin and Knee, 
will I hope uh, be able to lend some insight into why uh, being rejected at American University but getting into Harvard still has a hidden uh, benefit for uh, for Susan's daughter. But uh, with that overlong uh, introduction, uh, let me uh, turn it over to John and Susan and thank you both for being here tonight. You're welcome. Um, Thank you. you want I, me to I, introduce you now, Susan? <laughs> well, I want to say thanks to Bert for having us here. It is just such a pleasure to be with you. And as we chatted briefly, John and I are both huge fans of independent bookstores. So um, it's just a really a wonderful opportunity to be able to share what we know with your wonderful listeners. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to John. We're going to have a little conversation about why college admissions is rigged. John has his own experiences having gone through the process with three boys, one of whom just graduated a couple of weeks yep. ago. So take yep. it away, John. I wanna say, I wanna just share one weird anecdote before we start that has nothing to do with this. When I first moved back to California after being at NPR for roughly 20 years, I drove Lyft to get a sense of, you know, to re reacquaint myself with the area. And I gave a ride to Wendy Mogul one time. <laughs> And I picked her up right after I'd had a terrible experience with someone. And she basically gave me therapy for about an hour. And it was one of the great rides ever. And thank you. I've always thought that if I saw you again, I'd say thank you. <laughs> wow, what a crazy coincidence. Yeah, okay. that's weird. But, you know, let's not talk about that anymore because this is Susan's book we're here to talk about. Um, since the book isn't out, maybe we should start by just if you could just kind of, you know, the old elevator speech about what the book's about, my summary of it would be, you know, the college admissions process is a big, fat, wildly expensive mess, but don't panic. <laughs> is that close enough? Well, That's how would very you describe close. It? Yeah, I would say that the book's about decoding what is a secretive and inscrutable world of college admissions and financial aid. Um, it, it really is to try to help families get through this horrible morass that so many of us find ourselves in. And, and if you're out there listening and you haven't started the college search process, it can seem overwhelming, but I, but I hope that this book will give you, will be your GPS to get you through it. And, and you won't experience the horrible anxiety that Bert and John and I, um, and maybe uh, others had to go through because we just didn't have um, enough comprehensive. There's a lot of information out there but there's not a lot of good information. There's a lot of mixed messages, but there's not a lot of clear um, understanding. So I, I think that pretty much sums it up. It's decoding the secretive and in inscrutable world of college admissions and financial aid. Well, let's, um, why don't we step into the Wayback Machine for just a second here and um, to give people a, a sense of, you know, where this is coming from. It, it, there's a, always been a lot of talk in this country about how, you know, uh, college education is the golden ticket to all kinds of things, to social mobility being one of them, for most of the population, anyway, or, or much of it. Um, and once upon a time, I guess maybe, you'd say the end of World War II, uh, governments, everybody seemed to go out of their way to make it affordable for people to um, to get a college education. The GI Bill was the, the most, the biggest example of that. Um, and applying to college was a relatively simple process. I mean, a generation or two later when I applied, I just, you know, you took the test, you sent the essay, that was kind of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My question is, the long written question, right? What happened? I mean, it's it kind of seems more like a carnival now to apply for cup. You've got to go through this. Why don't you describe what what it has become? And well, I think that's a great question. I think just to give us some historical perspective. It, um, yeah, absolutely. Post World War II GI Bill uh, basically was about trying to get as many white men educated as possible at the least expensive cost. Um, the 60s and 70s opened that up to students of color and women. They passed a bunch of legislation during the 60s and 70s that uh, civil rights legislation, legislation to um, open up financial aid to women. 
And then we hit the Reagan administration. And when Reagan comes in, um, he and his allies in Congress instituted this free market ethos that this, they decided that they were going to cut financial aid programs um, and they were going to incentivize um, the free market to, uh, to persuade parents to take out more loans. So the government then started decreasing aid to students and increasing incentives to the, pri to pri the private loan industry. Um, at that point, the cost of college education started to go up, up, up. Rankings became a huge, huge business. Um, the rankings actually filled a void to give parents ostensibly information that they couldn't get about the value of a college education. Uh, but in fact, it was just a huge marketing and advertising machine um, that used very specious formulas to measure what boiled down to institutional wealth or the wealth of the college. Um, but rankings really drove up competitiveness uh, at elite institutions and also for students because parents, families, they all wanted their kids to get into what they thought were the best value colleges, the best quality colleges, all those highest ranked colleges. So what you end up having is a huge um, co competitive, stressful process as more and more families, more, more families were chasing these bragging rights to get their kids into the highest ranking schools and uh, financial aid became more uh, not based on need, but rather based on academic achievement. So it, as financial aid cut was cut for, for those who really needed it, those who could prep and get the best scores on tests and the best grades ended up getting the financial aid that used to go to needy students. So that's where we got into this crazy competitive environment we find ourselves in now. And few people really understand why um, why this has impacted the financial aid world so so um, so di so so much I guess is the word yeah I think I'm going to make you elaborate on a whole bunch of what you just said okay mm -hmm. um, you know we'll come back to it I, I'm you were like too much to write down <laughs> there's too much going on which you know I, I spoke to Susan that she was putting this book together and I got it you know writing about it was as frustrating as going through it was the impression I got. Um, <laughs> but it, it is one, it, is, it, is it another, is it also a good way of summarizing it to say that every step in this process has sort of become monetized? Yes, since, absolutely. You know. Everything is now, uh, the, well, what I, I call it is the college admission industrial complex. You have the rankings industries that, that are monetized. You have student loans um, that are huge business. Um, you have the marketing and advertising and recruiting industries that colleges uh, contract with. You have enroll the whole enrollment management industry that determines who gets merit aid scholarships, which is basically just a euphemism for um, tuition discounts, right? And, and so, yeah, it's just a huge market uh, that parents, students have no understanding how to win their way through it. And there's a lot of bad advice. A lot of bad advice out there, yeah. That's why it's, it's always fun. I love to take questions from parents and students because sometimes it's almost easier to just cut through all of this and answer a question in a way that gives them the information they need and points them in the direction to go, um, which is what I'm trying to do with the book. I'm trying to give parents exactly what they need. They can flip to the index. They can look and see um, in the table of contents wh what it is they, they don't understand and get those answers very quickly. Uh, I, I, would, I want you to elaborate a little bit more on just what the, uh, on the, the, the size of the, as you call it in your book, the you will fail without us industry of advisors and, mm -hmm. and test prep people and yeah. you know, people who arrange for you to have a, a you know, a, a special interest to go yeah. overseas or do something like yeah. that. I, how big is it? And, you know, it's about a $2 billion industry, what I like to call the pay to play industry. Um, it's, it's basically tutors, it's coaches, it's, um, scholarships, it's uh, 
summer camps. It's, it's people who are purporting to give you advantage in the college admissions um, game. And most of it is all rubbish. Um, you can find a good tutor to help you get through the admissions testing. That's going to be useful. If you, can, if you can get through the advanced placement classes and boost your, your, your grade point average, um, that's going to be useful. Uh, but all the rest of it is is not particularly useful, but it is a, a multi-billion dollar industry that has sprung up around college admissions and financial aid. Well, let me, since we're on that subject right now, how do you how do you tell a good advice or, or a good a good advice or a good helper from a bad one? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and I and 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 in researching the book, I actually came up with some some tips to give to parents. And it, and if you if you look in one of the chapters, has specific questions that you should ask before you hire someone. I think uh, a lot of parents, even middle class parents, now have to wade into this terrible industry and try to find someone who's decent decent to help them. And so many times they end up with people who fleece them essentially and don't give them the kind of advice that, that is helpful, um, that don't, they don't really know how to tutor calculus, you know? And so uh, in my book, what I try to do is give parents very specific suggestions on how to hire someone, right? What questions do you need to ask that person um, in order to find someone who's, who's, who's going to be worth the, the amount of money that you're paying, which is thousands of dollars? What, what's one of the questions you would ask? Well, you should, the person who you hire should give you a free consultation and you should be able to um, ask that the, the person that you're hiring, what exactly is their track record? Um, who else have they, you know, who else have they assisted? Uh, what do they know about calculus? I mean, the funny thing with, with, <laughs> with my own daughter is, you know, calculus was, was kind of one of those things that that she had a lot of trouble with and and i tried to get her we tried to get her out of calculus and the counselor wouldn't let her out because it was too late in the semester so so here she was in this calculus class you know and we didn't have any choice we had to find a tutor and she in the book i, I don't i know bert you read the intro in the book i go through you know all the tutors that she tried and, and jettisoned, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and um, finally found a guy who, who just came, I don't even know where he came from. He charged like 25 bucks an hour and gave her, gave her kind of therapy just to get her through calculus. So um, finding these tutors is, 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 is really a hard thing to do. Finding consultants and coaches. I think too many times parents go with, um, these big companies and they're just factories they don't really care about your your child individually i think one of the things i also say in the book is try to find a college student or a, or a high school student for instance we hired a high a high school student who had scored well on on his act you know by himself with no coaching and he was two years older and we hired him to tutor our daughter on her S act and that was 20 bucks an hour um we also looked at kids who were in the colleges where our kids wanted to attend and, and, and use those kids to help our kids with these applications. Because parents, if you're listening, these applications, I mean, I, I had no idea how to, it, it's, it's out of control, the common app, the, you know, all of the activities lists, and it's just ridiculous. And, and sometimes you just need to have somebody who's been through it, help your, help your kid through it. And that's what we did. We hired a college kid to do that. That's why you wrote an expose slash guide. Yeah, right? exactly. I mean, it was really as a, as a public service because we didn't spend very, we spent very, very little money prepping our kids for college. It, it was mostly, uh, I actually, for the older one, hired a, a child therapist who moonlit as a college coach. <laughs> well, you know, I'm curious, was there a point in this process mm -hmm. as you were, you and your, your daughters mm -hmm. were, uh, go, and, your, and Bob, your husband, yeah. were going through this application process that, um, that, that it just, was there a specific point where you were sitting at the table doing your loan application or something and you said, this, this is a racket. 
<laughs> Somebody needs to write about this. I'm going to yeah, write. You know, in retrospect, our two older boys are quite a bit older. Uh, my two stepsons are quite a bit older. And, and I, I don't I don't mean to leave them out. But honestly, their college applications were so they applied to UC. One went to UC Berkeley. One went to UC Santa Cruz. They wrote one essay. They didn't even ask us to look at anything. Yeah. We wrote them a, a check for, I think, 30 bucks to send in the application. And that was the end of it. And but but I will add, we got sucked into the financial aid morasses of the 90s in that at that point, there were huge loan wars going on. And we ended up borrowing $100,000 to put them through UC. And that was a huge mistake that I write about in the book. Um, and I think that experience um, and then going through the actual application experience with my with our third child who wanted to go to um, you know, a private college, not UC. She didn't want to go to UC, she wanted to go to private college. And then just trying to figure out the private college application with all the essays and the art supplements. And I mean, it was just overwhelming. So yeah, I think one, that experience of having our small house taken over by art supplements and college essays and piles of books stacked high on the kitchen table. I mean, at that point I said, this is ridiculous. We were hundred thousand dollars in debt and going through this, is, it was it was overwhelming. So yeah, I think that's what really, that's when I thought this is a story. <laughs> <laughs> without, without citing the lyrics to House of the Rising Sun or not that it's exactly the same thing, but you know, how do you, what's the advice you give to people to make sure they don't do the things you've done in terms yeah. of- I, I think oh, that's I, financial honestly, aid in particular. Yeah, honestly, that is really why I wrote this book because what you don't want to do, you don't want to do what we do. You do not want to borrow one hundred twenty thousand dollars to send your kids to UC uh, or to any school, right? And and um, that was that was on us, right? We we probably should have paid more out of pocket, but it was so easy to take out the loan. All you had to do literally was just sign on a dotted line, and they sent you one hundred twenty thousand dollars. I mean, it was the craziest thing. So um, I, it's not quite that easy anymore, thank God. Um, they tightened that up. But, uh, but yeah, the whole point of writing this book for me anyway was, as, as I keep saying, it's a, it's a public service. It's, it's to give parents the information they need to avoid the kind of crazy mistakes that we made. Um, borrowing, over borrowing, for instance, was, was a really bad mistake. Um, thinking that our third child would not get into college was another crazy mistake. I mean, she, <laughs> I, are you wrong? Yeah, so <laughs> wrong. I mean, honestly, she, she, we still laugh about it. She got, and she got a, her acceptance to Harvard. And I literally said, you did not get into Harvard. You are punking me. And she said, no, mom, I really got into Harvard. I mean, honestly, I thought she wasn't going to get into college anywhere. That's how crazy the system is. You're so beaten down by false information that you know you don't realize when you're in it how um completely convoluted it is and 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 i guess the advice that i would give to parents in retrospect is don't worry about it your kid if your kid has decent grades uh your child's going to do fine your child's going to get into college now whether or not you can pay for it is another matter altogether but I, I try to i try to tell parents don't get upset your child will get into a good college now the big Let's, problem will be trying to pay for it. I, I I think this is a good time to get you to explain to people what this phrase that, that keeps recurring in the book, the right fit, the best mm -hmm. fit. What does that mean in terms of finding yeah. the college? So the best fit for parents, the perfect fit for parents um, and the perfect fit for colleges are diametrically opposed. So. Um, Parents and families and students, they generally um, want a lot of times to get in or to get admitted to their dream colleges, which if you look at the uh, polling is, is about 25 colleges ranked highest on the new US news list. Um, and colleges take advantage of that by marketing and selling uh, to students this idea of exclusivity, and um, you know, if you if you get into our college, we have such a low admit rate. You, you know, it'll 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 change your life, and you know, you'll be welcomed into this club. Um, but 
in fact, they use that as a way to uh, boost their bottom line. And this is a little complicated, but if you'll just bear with me for a moment, I'm going to explain this. Um, so right fit to parents and students is they want to get into, they want to go to the best college that will accept them. And, and in their mind, the best college is, is, is on the best colleges US news list. But colleges want to accept students who um, either are very wealthy and can pay full price. So those students tend to be advantaged or they try to use this idea of right fit to convince parents to accept a low tuition discount, which they call merit aid. And by offering a, a low tuition discount, so if the price is 70,000 and they offer you uh, you know, a scholarship of 30,000 and they call it merit aid, well, you feel, wow, I must be so special but you're stuck holding the bill for $40,000. And you might very well be better off going to a UC campus um, and getting a better deal there or going to a less exclusive college and getting a higher discount. So in the book, I talk about how to position students so that they get the best financial aid possible. How can you as a family position and strategize so that your family pays the of the least amount of money for a college education. Um, and that's really what right fit should be about. Right fit should start with finding the financial fit first by using a net price calculator, by looking very um, realistically at the test scores and grades of the student applying and figuring out what colleges want that student and are willing to pay or discount give a higher discount to get that student because they want that student to boost their US news ranking. So it is a it is a strategy, but it's not a complicated one. And in the book, I lay this out very, very clearly, you know, do this, do this, do this, do this. And it, it is just isn't it isn't rocket science, but they want you to think it's very secretive and very exclusive. They want you to think it's rocket science. Yeah. So you'll use their rocket. Yeah. Um, we got a couple of questions, and why don't right. I just throw them out there? Um, sure. One is from Patricia to mm -hmm. everybody, and it's, is this process getting any better or worse? Uh, it is getting worse. <laughs> so let me put this, <laughs> let me put this in perspective. So if you're a really wealthy college and you're ranked highest on US News and World Report, and you got you all might have read this, uh, the news that came out this year where it was the lowest acceptance rates in history for, um, for the highest ranked colleges on the best colleges list. So if you're a wealthy college that ranks high, uh, you've got it made. I mean, everyone wants to go there. Um, you know, they're willing to pay the whatever price you want to charge them. Um, and you're in good shape. But the rest of the colleges, um, especially say mid-tier public colleges and small private colleges, uh, tuition dependent or, or with small endowments, they're in really bad shape. And so they're trying to lure you in with these um, tuition discounts. And you might've read recently that, that, that the average discount on tuition at private colleges is now 54% off sticker price. So you kind of have to understand the economics of um, higher education and college admissions to, to, to build a good strategy for your family individually. So the question is, is it gonna get better or worse? It's gonna get worse, but, there, but the good news is, if we elect politicians and lawmakers committed to providing free public or low cost public um, education, for those who are qualified to get in, I think it can get better. But it really, really just depends on the people we elect to Congress and 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 also our state legislatures because state colleges and universities are run by the state. So in a state like California, you have a very, very strong commitment to higher education. Alabama, not so much, right? So um, so it, it's a very um, it's, it's a very good outlook look for states that, that invest in the higher education like California, but not so good for Southern states that don't. I, um, you, did, you mentioned rankings. So why don't we talk about that a little bit? I, you know, I, 
every time I drive on a com college campus, I'll see a banner bragging about some aspect of the ranking. Yeah. And mm. it's kind of funny the lengths to which people will go or colleges will go to brag. It's yeah. you know, number one among colleges starting with an R where the president is left-handed or something like that. But yeah. how did, first of all, how did US News and World Report come to dominate the world of college rankings? And then well, the follow-up will be how much, you know, are they, are those rankings worth a damn? Um, well, how, you know, they got the early start. They got the early start in the 80s and early 90s. Um, and they, uh, they basically decided that they could make a ton of money by providing families with information they couldn't get anywhere else. So they decided that they were gonna they were going to create a formula that ranked quote unquote best colleges. And so families started believing that the that the formula they used was actually scientific, but in fact it, it never was. And um, in the book I talk about this, right? And I, I deconstruct the whole rise of US News best college rankings. And it's fascinating how they were able how they were able to use marketing and advertising and pseudoscience to convince people that the product they were offering was actually um, uh, an accurate assessment of, of quality. But, as, but as, a, as a college professor, I can tell you they don't rank learning. And so much of what you need in a college experience is the learning piece of it. And, and that is not at all part of the US News formula or actually any of the ranking product formulas. So um, they were just able, they did it first, they did it best, and they did a great job of staying on message for 40 years to convince the American public that the product they were selling was actually um, accurate when it, it frankly isn't it measures institutional wealth and that's pretty much it so what was you the mean, second question <laughs> well i just I, I there is a second question but i i want to know what they don't rank learning means because you um, can't rank learning i mean essentially um if you want to if you if you some of the things that you need to look at or look for in a college if you're going to pay that kind of money i mean if you're going to pay 70k to go to a private college then you should look for small class sizes, right? You should look for mentoring among faculty. You should look for uh, career services that actually help students find internships and jobs. You, sh you should look for um, colleges that can talk to you about how they teach critical thinking because critical thinking is the one skill you can take with you from college and apply to any field you want to pursue. Um, and so many colleges just don't invest in teaching anymore. They don't invest in faculty. What they're trying to um, promote is research, but so few students can take advantage of faculty and the research projects that they're pursuing. And too often faculty, as you know, John, spend so much time on their own research projects that they have very little time to spend with their students to mentor them um, to, uh, you know, help them with their careers. And I see one of my students is actually on the call or on the, uh, on our, uh, in our little session tonight. So if any of you want to talk to her about what it means to get a good education, I'm sure she'd be happy to share it with you. So when, when you try to do that, you can't measure learning. It's not possible. You'd have to go to 4,000 colleges. You'd have to survey all of the graduates. You'd have to it's not possible. And, and US News figured that out early on. Um, they knew that you couldn't measure learning. So what did they measure instead? The test scores and grades of high school seniors. That's how they measure quality. And you that's can't not measure, even, You can't measure class size or number Well, they of do mentoring. class size, yeah. Okay. They do class size. But that really is something that parents and students need to worry about. They need, because if you're going to go to a big research university like Cal or Michigan, your class size is going to be large, but ostensibly you're going to pay less money. If you go to a place like Chapman or Occidental, you know, what you want to do is pay all that money so that your, your the students can have relationships with faculty, can be mentored by faculty who really care about them and are invested in them. And I, I think I read in, in the book that, you know, one of the things about the right fit to just briefly go back to that is mm -hmm. There are a lot of schools 
or am I getting this right? I think one of the things you wrote is that there are a lot of schools that, you know, wouldn't be the first that you would mention if you were naming the top 10 schools, but they, and they, they so they don't have uniformly excellent programs, but they might have exactly the one mm -hmm. that your kid should be in if they want to study the classics or they want to study something like that. So is that part of what right fit is? Exactly. Means? Yeah. I mean, for really for parents, right fit should mean finding a good financial fit because honestly, most colleges have great faculty um, and it's worth paying for the relationship that students can have with faculty. That That is a price worth paying. Um, and they, they, there's there's so many um, questions that parents should ask about the quality of the education that their students will be receiving. Uh, that's the kind of questions that that students and, and parents should ask. What kind of research opportunities will students get? How um, often will they be able to meet with the actual faculty and not teaching assistants? Um, you know, those are those are the kind of questions that U.S. News and World Report Best Colleges don't answer. They also don't answer how many of the students graduate with debt, which is an important question to ask. Uh, what percentage of the students leave with debt? How much is the debt they leave with? Um, for instance, NYU, you know, is one of the most sought after schools in the nation. It also, you know, has um, students leaving with the most debt. So you really have to be very mindful of how much you can afford to pay and set those limits early on in the process, in the search process. Well, let's go back to that second question. And it's from Hillary to everyone. And I know it's one of your favorite subjects. Mm -hmm. It's what do you think the fate of the SAT and ACTs will be? And why did I send them so much money? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, that is so true. Well, you, we've heard a lot recently pandemic caused um, so many colleges and universities go test optional. And that's a bit of a smoke screen. Only 60 colleges in the nation are test blind, which means those colleges do not consider test scores, period. 60 out of something like three or 4,000. Um, the rest, the test optional colleges, uh, they allow you to submit those scores. Um, and they are still looking at those scores because those scores are still factors in US News and World Report rankings. And they're still using those test scores to award scholarships. And let's just say all of those schools decided to become test blind. Then what do colleges use to determine admission and financial aid or scholarships? They used advanced placement classes. So um, advanced placement classes and testing products are also part of the college board. So you're just gonna have to game the whole advanced placement um, college board uh, industry. Um, it's a racket. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just the whole thing is a big racket. And I think, again, I go back to the same thing over and over again. If we, um, as a nation committed to providing free and low cost degrees to students who are qualified, um, a lot of this mess would just go away. The private colleges that are, that are not worth the money would go out of business and those that are high quality would stay in business and they'd have fewer students to choose from um, because people would be so, uh, you know, they, they'd be going to the public colleges. It would be an entitlement in a way that social security is and in a way that it used to be, at least in the state of California. But the second half of the SAT ACT question was, what are they doing with all that money? They do take in a ton of money, don't they? Where where yeah. do they put it all? Well, um, did you hire a forensic accountant or something? Yes, I, I did. I did, Don. You, yes. So um, I tried to find that out myself, and I spent quite a lot of time looking at the tax returns for the college board and came up uh, absolutely empty. So uh, I hired a friend's accountant to review the 120 page tax returns. And um, we discovered that hundreds of millions of dollars are being invested in the Cayman Islands in, uh, in, in tax free secret accounts. And um, the college board refused to explain why they put all this money in tax free accounts. They are a nonprofit. So it's not like they have to pay taxes, but then the accountant said, well, some of this stuff 
is taxable income, but we can't figure out what it is. So he gave me a list of questions to ask the college board. And of course the college board just said, well, we don't have to answer any of your damn questions. So um, it is a huge unregulated gatekeeper to higher education, uh, unmonitored. Um, a lot of people would say break up the college board. Um, I, I guess I would put myself in the camp where, you know, the college board is going to be the college board, but they should be transparent about why they are, why did, why are they a $2 billion nonprofit? Why are they only spending 10% of their uh, revenues on fee waivers, um, which, which would be helpful to low income kids? Why are they not reinvesting some of those billions of dollars in trying to actually level the playing field to help students get the kind of quality test prep they need in order to pass these horrible exams. Um, most families can't afford the, the test prep that, um, and some families pay $10,000 for test prep. I mean, I interviewed many families that paid five, 10, $15,000 for test prep, college coaches, $100,000 for college coaches that start in seventh grade. So yeah, the college board should be using some of that some of those $2 billion to, to actually provide high quality test prep and tutoring for students who don't have advantages that you'll find in, in, in affluent suburban high schools or private high schools, private, private preps. And they're not doing enough of that. No, they're not doing any of it because no one is holding them accountable. The Department of Education isn't. No one, it's just a big, uh, I call it the third rail of, of college admissions because no one will take on the college board. No one will. And I think just getting a conversation started about making them transparent, I think would be a, a great service to the nation. What, what are they doing with $2 billion besides paying themselves million dollar salaries, which they do do. I, I'm assuming that if you had found evidence of fraud or anything illegal when you when you had that guy look at the college boards, mm -hmm. you would have you would have said so. Right? I would have said so, but he didn't. You know, <laughs> it's it's so it's so obscure that you you don't know what's happening, right? Because we don't know why they have hundreds of millions of dollars in overseas in the Cayman Islands. I mean, who knows, right? So, who knows what they're doing with it? I think that's the point, right? Let's have a conversation about making them become more transparent about yeah. how how they collect and spend money. I got also a question from Patricia, mm -hmm. who says, is it true that schools will relax admission standards for spring admission because they don't report scores from the Department of Education and don't factor into their rankings? I think I understand that question because I had a son who got into college, but they, they accepted him for the spring. I'm sorry, could you, re okay, so could you repeat the question sure. again? Is it true that schools will relax admission standards for spring admission because they don't report scores to the Department oh, of Education. Right. That yes, that is true, 100%, yes. Why That's, would they do that? Um, because they're they're very focused on boosting or maintaining their rank, um, oh. right? And so one, one workaround uh, for them to get in, usually more affluent students, is to admit them in the spring. So let's say you're, you, let's say the call, let's say you're a student who has kind of Midland test scores or Midland grades and and you don't want in your college that you don't you want the kid because the kid's going to bring in full or near full tuition, but you don't want that kid's uh, lower test scores to bring down your ranking. So one one workaround is to admit those students in the spring. Okay, um, I suppose we you know that the elephant in any room where colleges are uh, being talked about is, of course, the the Rick Singer mm -hmm. um, scandal involving, you know, cheating and bribery and all these things and photoshopping heads onto people and, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that big scandal mm -hmm. it, at least will be coming to an end in terms of the legal action relatively soon when Singer gets sentenced. Um, is, is that going to you know, is that a problem that's getting better or worse? Will will that particular scandal make things better? Is that well, um, you know, that scandal is is it's almost like beside the point in a way. I mean, I guess in in the sense that so few people have that kind of money to uh, pay someone to do what he did. 
um, it, it's, it's, it's sort of a great distraction and we all love it because we love to see these celebrities get, you know, their comeuppance for doing all these dirty deeds. But the bottom line is it's kind of a distraction from the bigger picture, which is the, the broken system of college admissions and financial aid for the 99.9% .9 who, who aren't Rick Singer's clients. Um, so in that regard, no, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's great in the sense that it actually put a spotlight on, on what's wrong with college admissions. But again, it was one of those situations where it just was a lot of confusing, um, so many confusing messages that, that people couldn't make sense of what it meant. And, and it, 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 really, it really was a distraction. Um, also, Rick Singer probably won't serve much time and he'll probably not pay too much of a fine because he turned on his clients. So it, it all was kind of very sorted and um, really would be better for us to focus on on the rest of the 99% who, who, who don't have that kind of money and, and don't have that kind of opportunity to buy their way into anywhere. They just have to work with what is and what's getting worse. So let, let's go back to the beginning here. Um, before I just hand it over to the authorities <laughs> for to, to moderate any more questions we might have. And, and that's and and kind of re-ask a question generally, because we've talked a lot about the things that are wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about how this this giant carnival-like atmosphere surrounds the admissions process and you know, how it can be very hard to tell the, the crooks from the actual good advisors and all that stuff. But I, I don't think we've talked enough about the don't panic part. You yeah, know, that's a good point. <laughs> like yeah, if you can give people, point. you know, yeah. you yeah, tell them don't worry point. about it. But, you know, what are, if somebody has a child who's, I don't know when the process starts now, in the eighth grade or something, and <laughs> if you're about to enter into that years long process to, to see if you can get your kid into the school they want to go to. Um, what would you tell those people starting out? What's, what's, what, what do they really need to know? Well, so, okay, if, if you're a lower income student, you're going to be in a different kind of circumstance. And if you're a middle class, upper middle class or affluent student, um, you know, if you, if you go to a, if you're, First of all, if you go to a private school, a private prep, any of the private preps in LA, I mean, they have all kinds of college admissions help and you're going to be fine. You get, you know, you get decent grades, you get Bs, you're going to get prepped, you know, for the tests, you're going to get tutors. I mean, you're going to get the help you need. If you're in an affluent high school, you're also probably going to be fine. If you're, if you're going to, you know, if you're, if you're going into AP classes and you're doing reasonably well and, and you can, um, you can afford the tuition at say a UC, you're gonna get into a UC. Um, so I guess I would say, don't be anxious about it because as long as you're, as long as you're kind of doing what John, you and I did or Bert, you know, did when we were trying to go to college, which we got the best grades we could get. We were interested in learning, I guess. I mean, I know I was when I was in high school, but I, I didn't take AP classes. I mean, I also, my kids like to joke, I went to a, I shouldn't say this because it isn't a, that I went to well, Occidental. <laughs> I went to Occidental College, which isn't, you know, it's not the top 10 rank college. It was a great experience. Um, I didn't stress one bit to go to put in a college application. Um, and I got a great, I got a great education. Now, admittedly, that was before the loan wars of the of the 90s and Ronald Reagan cutting, you know, um, financial aid and all that. So getting in isn't going to be the problem. Don't stress about getting in. That is not going to be the problem if you are a parent who's listening to this conversation right now. If you're a student who's um, concerned about it, you're going to be fine. Get good grades. Do some activities that you love. Follow your, your, your passions about what you love. If you're from a low-income family, get a part-time job. And, you know, those things, very basic advice in the book that I think is 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 calming, it's accurate, and it's going to help you get through this very stressful time, right? It's going to put things in perspective. The bigger issue, if you don't have a lot of money, is how are you going to pay for it? So, um, and that also in the book talks about how can you strategize so that you can get the most financial aid possible? 
And there, it is just not that hard. You can do a few things like, you know, figure out what colleges you're, you're going to be in the top 5%. Those are the ones where you're going to get the most merit aid. Um, and there's plenty of colleges out there that are excellent with great faculty. Don't forget that. They might not have a great name, but they have great faculty. And that's what you're looking for. The faculty, the relationship with the mentors, um, the opportunities afforded through the Career Development Center. Those are the things that really matter, not whether or not they're number one on the you know, list of this or that, but really what kind of learning are you going to get at the school where you go to? Are you going to a school that values teaching? I think that's probably, if you go to a school that values teaching and you put financial fit first, you're going to be fine. Your kids are going to be fine. Are there particular financial aid? I mean, there. Are, I know that there are a lot of financial aid scams out there, but are there particular ones you should avoid? Is there? Well, you want to you, you want to maximize financial aid, and unfortunately, in this day and age, um, elite colleges. If you can get into elite college, that's uh, you know, there's twelve of them, and in the book, I actually in the if you look in the book, I actually list all of the colleges um, in best. <laughs> colleges and what their financial aid policies are and how you can strategize um, and leverage your qualifications to get the best deal out of those colleges. So there's a whole list in there. Um, I think it's like 15 pages long, um, very, very clearly explaining how to leverage the best deal out of these um, colleges on the US news list. Um, so that is not that difficult, right? You figure out where it is you fall in their accepted students. If you're in, if you, if you're better than most of the accept their students they accept, you're probably going to get a good financial aid package from that school. Well, my final question before I turn it over is why is it that none of the people in the newsroom behind you have moved? <laughs> That's not a Zoom screen, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, John, you busted me on that one. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> sorry about that. But as I mentioned previously, if you saw my office, it's covered in stacks of papers and boxes that I used to write this book. So uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, now that the book is done, I'll clean out my office and I can put to bed the newsroom uh, okay. screen. <laughs> okay. Um, can I just ask a quick question? Sure. Uh, maybe uh, sure. it's a Wendy Mogul type question. I see she has one up, but um, here's my my question uh, comes from the real life of having a law partner partner whose son got into a very good school, but is on the waiting list at a school that he is his dream school for reasons that no one can can express. How do you manage? How do you manage the expectations of an 18 year old? who has created a dream and what, how do you manage not getting into the dream school? Oh, that is such a great question for, I don't know if you're talking about my own experience with this, but this happened to my daughter. Um, her first choice, choice college was Swarthmore. She dreamed of going to Swarthmore from like seventh grade. I didn't even know where this school was. And, you know, she just had to go to Swarthmore. And what's the first rejection she gets? Swarthmore, right? So um, I think, well, what I did is I just hid the letter and hoped that she'd get in somewhere else. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. Um, I wouldn't recommend that as a strategy. But I think the better strategy is to manage expectations at the outset. So I don't know if your friend's uh, family circumstances is, is maybe can you, you know, if your family, if that family can pay full tuition, well, that's going to be a different kind of management issue than if you're a family that can't pay full tuition and really does have to find a financial fit first. So I guess my question to you would, would be, and that's why it's so important that you get advice that's particular to your family and your individual circumstance. So I guess I would have to throw that back on you. Is this a family who can pay full tuition, who can afford regardless of where he gets in, the, the family can afford to send him? Well, yeah, he's a law firm partner. And so we can only hope that he'll be able to pay full tuition. Okay. <laughs> so those kids are a little more difficult to manage because if, if you can't afford it, right, you can always start at the beginning saying, okay, honey, okay, these are the, 
you know, these are the parameters we're working with here. And I go through the book and I, I actually give advice on how to have the conversation with the student about saying, okay, well, you know, you can't borrow more than what you're going to get in subsidized loans. And we as parents are not going to borrow except if we can get a subsidized loan. And you can't borrow more than it, you expect to earn in the first year. So that's for a family who's really got to watch, you know, the affordability piece. If it's a if it's a family who can pay full tuition, that's a little tougher because those families, and I don't mean to insult your friend or anything, but they have come to expect the, you know, the best. And for them, the best is the top ranked school. Now, you probably can't say which schools it is he's trying, the, the school on whose wait list he is. Can you or can you not? Hey, you know, Susan, I'll insult his friend. Okay. No, can I won't say, really, but you, you know, I will it? say that just it's a relevant point. I think that the process of managing expectation cuts both ways that you have to manage. Sometimes the student has to manage or the applicant has to manage the parents' yeah. <laughs> expectations because I, I've read somewhere that, uh, you know, the, the, all the lying and cheating and deceiving that goes on in an effort to get in, in, into elite schools. Yeah. One of the theories is, is it won't abate until parents stop treating yeah kids at elite schools like you know status symbols like having a mercedes in the driveway yeah so it cuts both ways that's right. see that's the issue and i think i know you said that the son the child was the one who was really you know having a hard time right or you said it was it was actually the child but then you have to ask yourself because i had a friend whose child was just so set on stanford and was crushed when she, you know she got got on the wait list but didn't get in well, you know, she went off to a small liberal arts college, had a great experience. So it really, again, it's hard to say in abstract because I would, I would actually talk to the kid and say, okay, you're choosing between this college and this college. And let's look at, you know, let's say you go into this college, um, you know, you're going to be fine and it's going to be a great experience. And why are you so wedded to this other college over here? Why? Right? You have to kind of almost be a shrink, a therapist to find out why, why are you so wedded to this other college when you're going to have just as great an experience, you know, at this other school. Katie, I see uh, Wendy and Patricia have some couple of questions and then we probably should let everybody resume their ordinary uh, <laughs> uh, lives here. It's getting late. Yes. Okay. So uh, there's a question from Patty and I may have you clarify, Patty. Um, can you talk about the role of high schools, specifically private high schools in driving demand. And I'm not sure what the demand is for. Oh, Elite colleges, right? I think Susan knows. Yeah, okay. Elite colleges. Okay. Thanks, Katie. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So I have a whole great anecdote in the book about this, about Sidwell friends. Um, these, yeah, elite, I mean, these elite private preps, they are their own game. Um, they, they, play kids off each other and they play families off each other and they play favorites. And I mean, really, I, I would really hope that you would read this anecdote that I have about a student um, who uh, got rejected. She went, went to Sidwell and she, she was not like the top, top in the class, but I think she was in the top 10%. She's African-American, um, you know, but they hated her family. <laughs> So, um, and there's this, this anecdote about what she went through and she ended up getting rejected or, you know, pretty much rejected from every college she applied to. And they just put up a wall of um, negative, uh, you know, negativity around this poor young woman. And so I, I think that they play their own games. I know that they have special relationships with college admissions officers at elite colleges and they and they promote the kids they like to the detriment of the kids they don't like. So it can often be that you have a better chance in the admissions game if you don't go to a private prep, because if you go to a private prep and you're not among the few favored, then you know, you're not gonna necessarily get into that, that college that you wanna go to, that you've had your heart set on since seventh grade, whatever that college is for, I don't know. <laughs> that Sidwell case went to court, didn't it? It did, went, it went all the way up to the Supreme Court, yeah. They and who did Sidwell to... call as one of their expert witnesses? They called Rick Singer as an expert witness <laughs> before he um, before he was discredited. Yeah, 
So I think it's a great anecdote, Patricia, if you're really interested in, in, in kind of seeing, laying how bare about how these private schools manipulate the system um, to their benefit and to the benefit of a favored few. Great question. I'll say all of this makes me incredibly glad I am well past college admissions for myself <laughs> and a long way off from dealing with college admissions for anyone else. Oh, goodness. Um, so this, this last one is from Wendy. Um, and I'll just read it all. Uh, not my quote, but I like it. Elite schools are hedge funds that teach classes as a tax dodge or a non-cynical <laughs> angle. Parents are, are not just bamboozled, but frightened about our burning planet, unpredictable, and in Susan's words, inscrutable economy. For them, a reassuring college placement reassures. Important to have compassion for the striving, a sensible view of what you can afford, and the real resources of a school, not the bumper picker, not the bumper sticker sheen. Yeah, yeah. Read Susan's book. Oh, well, <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much for that. And yeah, I will put in one plug for those colleges. <laughs> They're totally affordable. That's the only downside to those uh, quote unquote elite colleges. If you can get into one of them and you're a middle class family, you can afford it. It was cheaper for us to send our kids to Harvard than to UC. So go figure. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, God, you know, we should make, all, that's why, you know, that's why I promote free college tuition, free public college tuition, because we shouldn't all have to go into debt to send our kids to college. It's just not right. Yeah. Well, let me, let me um, wrap this up and uh, thank John and Susan and our very, as usual, engaged uh, audience for participating in this important discussion. Um, I promise Susan, since the, uh, the book is not been won't be released till next week. Uh, that maybe at the beginning of the school year, when when the panic starts again, <laughs> that we would uh, reprise this uh, evening so that uh, more people could uh, get to hear this uh, important story and more people have a chance to, more importantly for us, buy this book at your volume's <laughs> books. But uh, let me end by thanking uh, everybody for being here tonight. This was really a fun, interesting evening. So thanks so much. Thank you. And thank thanks. everyone. And happy to take any questions if you have them. Just shoot them to Bert and he'll send them to me. Thanks so much. Thank you, Susan. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Okay.